Hello, this is Pastor Marlon Jackson, Loveland Church. I'm chairman of the Ministers Alliance here at Loveland. And every, every year during Passion Week, we put together messages that celebrate uh, Passion Week and the events leading up to the crucifixion. Um, we're going to have our senior pastor, Chuck Singleton, introduce those speakers. Thank you, Thank you Pastor Jackson. This preacher that you're about to hear, Robert Banks, has served in this church for a number of years, for decades, in fact. He now is our elder at large at our church, meaning he goes between the elders, the trustees, and the deacons to uh, keep us all rolling together. Man of God, and I'm pleased to call him my friend. He loves the Lord Jesus and believes in the resurrection. Robert Banks. Good evening. I appreciate the opportunity to give a word from the Lord. Uh, what the Lord gave me from coming from Mark chapter 14, verses 32 through 42. And that's where Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. The title of my message is, The Pressure Jesus Endured. The scripture reading, again, Mark 14, 32 through 42. It says, They went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here a while. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that, if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba Father, he said, Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he, then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we just say thank you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this hour, Father God. And thank you for an opportunity to come before you. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that your spirit, Lord, would move through, through me, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in thy sight. O oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's uh, amazing how Jesus picked the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane in the Greek is oil press. And if you know about an oil press, what it's used for is to press out the fluids from whatever, is, whatever item is going through it. The Hebrew is bekith, a weeping or a mourning. From the prime root, baka is to weep. And if you know, while Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he weeped. And he was weeping because he knew what was about to take place. Three things I'm going to give you tonight. One is the pressure. And that goes through verses 32 through 34. So Jesus wants us to know as a man he was pressed. The pressure of his life and what he came to do for us. Knowing he would not be able to be with the Father except for his sacrifice. Hebrews 10, 9 and 10 says, Then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. He set aside the first to establish the second. And by the will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Number two, the obedience. 
verses 35 through 38. It says, in these verses, even though Jesus asked the Father to take this cup from him, Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus went to the Father three times. Meaning, we don't go to God just once for the things we petition, but about what the Father wants from us. Because continue, God says enough. Until you continue, God says enough. Jesus' example is telling us it's not about us, but about what the Father wants to do through us. 1 John 2, 5, and 6, But if anyone obeys His word, the love of, for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in Him. However, claims, excuse me, whoever claims to live in Him must live as Jesus did. Number three, the faith. Verses 39 through 42. Jesus knew what was to come and where He would be again with the Father in heaven. He showed us no matter what the circumstances are in your life, have the faith and trust God that He is there with you and He will bring you through anything. And that's anything. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. And if I didn't say it at the beginning, this is coming from uh, the NIV. Uh, version. So these verses in my text is from the NIV. It says, What I read to you was the words Jesus. John 1.1 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And John 1.14 And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten Son. It says, what I just told you, you will have pressure in this life. But to be obedient to God, no matter what things look like. And to have faith that comes from knowing whose you are. And He will never leave you nor forsake you. Deuteronomy 31.6 Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. And then I have one, John 17, 1 through 5. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you came to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Go with God, because he goes with you. Amen. We're pleased to present to you Dr. Shonda Smith as one of the associate ministers at Loveland Church. And for all the right reasons, because of the Word of God, and she loves the Word, I know this because I've known her since she was a little girl. And so I'm especially proud that she grew up to earn her doctor's degree and become a professor at a major university, Liberty University, out of Lynchburg, Virginia. And uh, Dr. Shonda loves Jesus. She loves his word. She's now working on another doctorate in a different field. We're pleased that she could share with us tonight. Get ready to get blessed with Dr. Smith. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am excited to share with you from the book of Matthew, the 26th chapter. We're going to begin at the 14th and read to the 17th verse. 
and then skip over to the 47th chapter and conclude at the 56th verse. I will be reading from the NIV version. Then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Verse 47. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kissed is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of the twelve companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and be, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place, that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Father, I thank you for the reading of your word. And not just the reading of your word, but the hearing of your word. I pray that the eyes of our hearts, as we hear, the eyes of our hearts will be open. The eyes of understanding will be enlightened. For in your light, you said, we see light. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to open up and begin by asking you, have you ever been betrayed? Was it someone that you knew? Was it someone you trusted? Was it someone close to you? What was that experience like for you? And what did you learn? Well, today I want to talk to you about the betrayal of Jesus. Judas was the one who would betray Jesus. And it's interesting because the scripture says he was one of the 12 disciples. Not that that's interesting, but what is interesting is it didn't say he was one of 100 disciples. It didn't say he was one of 1,000 disciples. He was one of 12, a very small number. Uh, a small number of, of men that had this privilege, access to Jesus, a position of honor. Why would Jesus, Judas betray Jesus? Why would he give up his access, his privilege access, his position? Well, the short answer would be is that it was the will of the Father. And in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, we're going to read two, vo two verses, verse 14. And verse 21, it says that if one died, then all die, referring to Jesus. And then in verse 21, it says that God gave Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us, that we all would become the righteousness of God. And so Jesus would be this perfect sacrificial lamb to not just redeem us from our sins, but to restore us to a place of righteousness. But that couldn't happen unless this act of betrayal had to take place. So that leads me to my very first point. The act of, betray of Jesus' betrayal was not surprising to God. It might have been, I imagine, maybe surprising to the 12 disciples, and in particular, maybe Judas, that he would be surprised that he would do such a thing. But to God, it was not a surprise. And in fact, the Old Testament prophecies uh, foretold of Jesus' uh, betrayal. Let's go and look at Zechariah, the 11th chapter and the 12th verse, just to give you a little bit of context, is that God called Zechariah to uh, become a shepherd over a flock. And um, in the course of time, Zechariah became impatient and weary with this flock. And the flock 
also detested him. And so he gave up his position, Zachariah, and um, told them that he would not shepherd them no longer. And so he uh, talked with the employers that hired him to sort of work out what his wages would be. And so since his employers detested him, they wanted to insult him by offering him 30 pieces of silver. Some translation says 30 pieces of shekel, which is a small amount. It wasn't a lot, that wasn't a large amount. And this is the amount that actually the, the price that was paid for a slave's accidental death. So we see here the fulfillment of this in Matthew 26, 15, when G Judas, speaking with the chief priest, asked what he would be given once he delivered Jesus over to them. And, and like the, the shepherds uh, detested Zechariah, so the chief of priests detested Jesus. And so they counted out to Judas 30 shekels because that's all they considered Judas to be worth. So my first point is that Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Point two, Judas was someone close to Jesus. He wasn't an ordinary person. He wasn't just some random person. He was someone that was close to Jesus. That's what makes this betrayal painful. In fact, Jesus called him friend. In Psalms 41st chapter, the ninth uh, verse says, even my close friend whom I trusted, he who shared my bread has lifted up his heel against me. And we see the fulfillment of that in Matthew, the 26th chapter, the 21st verse, where Jesus is speaking, says while they were eating, he said, one of them, one of you will betray me. And then we skip down to verse 23. The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me, referring to Judas. And then over into Matthew, the 26th chapter, again, skipping to the 50th verse when they are uh, beginning to arrest Jesus, Jesus turned to Judas and said, friend, he called Judas friend, do what you came for. I don't know about you, but if someone conspired to betray me, that person is not my friend. But Jesus called Judas a friend. And so my third and final point is that the betrayal had to take place. In Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, the 10th verse says, yet it was the Lord's will to uh, crush him and to cause him to suffer. And we see the fulfillment of that in Matthew, the 26th chapter, the 56th verse says that, and this is Jesus speaking, this all had to take place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. So I close with this. The Jesus betrayal, it served a purpose. And as I said before, it was the will of the Father. And yes, this act of betrayal was painful, unthinkable, but it served a purpose. And let me tell you, pain has a purpose. And Father God does not waste any of our painful experiences. And so I leave you with this. In Jesus' story, in his act of betrayal, it had a purpose. In your story, did your pain have an act of purpose? Or did your, did your pain have purpose? And I pray that as you ask God to open your eyes of understanding, and that you look a little bit more close, look from his perspective, that you will see from his perspective, and that you will begin to see what the purpose was.